I'm Susan Kennedy and welcome to our County Council Town Hall meeting. Tonight we are at the Long Branch Community Center in Silver Spring where we have a full house of residents who are here to ask their council members questions about the issues that are on their minds. But before we get started we do have some special guests here tonight that we would like to recognize and introduce for coming out tonight. First we have Lillian Cruz who is here representing Senator Chris Van Hollen's office. There she is waving over there. Thank you so much. <laughs> Joseph Young, who is representing C Congressman Jamie Raskin's office. Stand up for us, please. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Vicki Garcia, representing Congressman John Sarbanes. Gabe Albernaz, who is the director of the Department of Recreation for Montgomery County. Gabe, where did you go? Well, he was here. I don't see him. <laughs> Eric Friedman. He is our man. He is the director of the Office of Consumer Protection. There he is, over there. We'd also like to welcome the members of Montgomery County's 3rd District Police Force for being here with us tonight. Thank you so much. So now it is time to get started with this meeting. These folks are anxious to ask their questions, but before we do so, I'm going to turn it over to Council President Roger Berliner for some opening remarks. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is a privilege to be here at Long Branch, and thank you so much for joining us. We are here really to respond to the things that are on your mind, as Susan mentioned. So we will not filibuster, and I will not filibuster in this moment, as tempting as it is. I will allow each of my colleagues to introduce themselves, starting on my left with Mr. Elrich. I'm Mark Elrich. I'm a county council member at large. I chair the Public Safety Committee. I'm on the Education Committee, and I live a few blocks from here. Good evening, everyone. I'm Craig Rice, a uh, member of the Montgomery County Council representing District 2, which starts with North Potomac and Montgomery Village going all the way up to the Frederick County line. I chair the Education Committee and am on the Health and Human Services Committee. I'm George Leventhal. I represent everyone in Montgomery County as one of your at-large members, but I live just down the street on Piney Branch Road. I'm uh, chairman of the Health and Human Services Committee and uh, serve on the Planning, Housing, and Economic Development Committee. Everybody, I'm Hans Reamer. I'm one of the four at-large council members. And I serve on the Planning, Housing, Economic Development Committee, as well as the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee. I'm very glad to be here, and I love Long Branch. Ms. Florine, to you. Sure. Hi, every hi everyone. I'm Nancy Florine, uh, the fourth at-large member of the County Council. I chair the uh, Planning, Housing, and Economic Development Committee and sit on the Transportation, Energy, Infrastructure, and Environment Committee. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sidney Katz. I'm the District 3 County Council member. I represent Rockville and Gaithersburg and parts of Potomac and parts of North Potomac, parts of Durwood, parts of Redland, all the way down to Leisure World. And I sit on the Government Operations Committee as well as the Public Safety Committee. Good evening, everybody. My name is Nancy Navarro, and I joined the County Council in 2009. I actually represent District 4, and it's the mid part of the county. I chair the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee, and I also serve on the Education Committee. It is really a pleasure to be with you this evening, and I look forward to our conversation. And again, my name is Roger Berliner. I do have the privilege of serving as president of the council, but I also serve as chairman of the Transportation, Infrastructure, Energy, and Environment Committee and serve on the HHS Committee. But my real purpose right now is introducing to you someone who should need no introduction, a great district council member and a great colleague of mine on the T&E Committee, Tom Hucker. Thank you. Wow. Um, thank you. Um, Thank you, Roger, for that overly generous introduction. It was, um, it, well, actually, it was overly generous. I'll still, I was going to vote for your bill anyway. Um, uh, welcome to Silver Spring. Welcome to Long Branch. Welcome to my neighborhood. It's great to see so many old friends and neighbors and uh, hopefully new friends after this is over. Um, I um, have been in this neighborhood for quite a while. I was been working in this neighborhood for even longer, starting Progressive Maryland 17 years ago. It's very nice to see a lot of organizers from my former organization here uh, keeping us honest. I represented this district for eight years in the Maryland General Assembly, and I've been lucky enough to represent this district on the county council for the last two years as well. Um, I want to tell you, since 
I have been on the county council. It's, it's a fantastic experience, and I want to use my additional couple minutes I'm told I have to thank my colleagues, because since I've been there, I have been a fierce advocate for Silver Spring, and I want you to know you don't have one, you have nine fierce advocates for Silver Spring on this council. Last year, we passed a historic budget that invested a record amount of money in our public schools for the first time in many, many years. Lots of new money into school construction and affordable housing, priorities that we hear in Long Branch and Silver Spring and all over Montgomery County. And it was this council that every single one of us voted for that budget. We also, I'll give you a couple quick local examples. Last month, we voted to, uh, for a my bill to create, to promote urban agriculture, to keep Charlie Coiner, 96-year-old Charlie Coiner, farming in downtown Silver Spring and bringing his locally grown healthy produce to the Silver Spring farm market so that farm doesn't get sucked up by developers. And I introduced that bill, but this council, every single one of them voted for that bill to protect Charlie Coiner's farm. Yesterday, I introduced, they all voted for a bill to crack down on foreclosed properties, these empty, vacant houses all over Silver Spring that are owned by Deutsche Bank, owned by Bank of America, owned by Wells Fargo, that bring down your property values and increase the crime. I voted for, I, I introduced that, they all voted for that unanimously yesterday. And next week, they're all gonna vote, I'm pretty sure, <laughs> for a companion bill I have to crack down on individually owned vacant properties as well to use the best practices that are used all around the country in Montgomery County to crack down on absentee owners that are driving down our property values and driving up crime. So thank you all for coming to Silver Spring and to Long Branch. The first round is on me at El Golfo after this. <laughs> Ms. Kennedy, it's back to you and to questions from our audience. Okay, one other quick note, folks. Um, if you do want to ask a question oh. in Spanish, we do have translation yeah. available for you. Lillian Moss is here. So if you have a question and you speak Spanish, she will translate it for you. Susan, so, we have one other I thing. I apologize. Oh, sure. Also, uh, they're all VIPs, but on the VVIP list, we missed former council member, District 5 council member, Rose Cranka is in the audience oh. as well. Wow. Oh, wow. Hi, Mrs. Cranka. <laughs> okay, here we go. Yeah, my name is Scott Schneider. I'm a 32-year resident of Silver Spring, live in this area. <clears throat> and uh, I want to ask, Montgomery County prides itself on its diversity, its economic and racial diversity. And as the neighborhoods gentrify, we lose that diversity in the schools. The neighborhoods become more segregated with poor residents and new immigrants finding it unaffordable. Uh, everyone knows we can't build our way out of this problem. So what is the council doing to preserve our existing stock of affordable housing? Ms. Ms. Florine, did you uh, just chair well, the... I'll be, I'll be happy to start off on that. Uh, we've done as much as we can. We've offered, uh, as Thomas said, we're looking at the uh, registration and uh, maintenance of foreclosed properties. And we, we've been pumping a lot of money into neighborhood support systems. Uh, community organizations that want to beautify in modest ways their communities. We put a lot of money into resurfacing of roads, street trees, all the kinds of things that make you proud of your community. Um, over the years, we have passed legislation that has restricted some of the infill development. Uh, so it can't be, there's still, some of the infill tends to be a little large, but it's not as high or as wide as some of that could be. And we've done a lot in terms of encouraging the right kind of uh, affordable housing uh, throughout Montgomery County. Right now we're uh, figuring out the best way to do that in Bethesda. We've done that in the Long Branch Master Plan. Uh, we've done that in Glenmont. And we've done that in Silver Spring. So over the years we've done quite a bit. In fact, it was mentioned, uh, uh, was that yesterday, uh, that Montgomery County has preserved more affordable housing than any place in, or has generated more controlled affordable housing than any place in the country, if you add it all up. But at the same time, we've invested a lot in helping communities uh, retain their character, uh, look at the streetscape programs. We'll see what happens with these CDBG funds that uh, President number 45 is threatening to remove uh, resources for. Uh, but we have done a lot of work over the years to pr try to preser preserve uh, communities. I was, in, I, was on the I was on the planning board years ago when we did the Silver Spring Master Plan, and uh, part of that also 
uh, involved a lot of community engagement. And as you know, it's hard to drive through the communities right around downtown. And that was part of a community consensus in how we protect existing communities from the development that happens within the central business districts. So I'm going to call on Mr. Reamer. All of us would like to answer every uh, one of your questions, I promise you. But if we are going to hear from you as opposed to us, I'm going to try and limit it to two responses per question, if possible. Mr. Reamer. Scott, promoting housing affordability is probably the hardest thing that we deal with at the local level here in Montgomery County. It is the hardest thing that we deal with. We are doing a lot, and we always need to do more. The Bethesda sector plan that we're taking up right now has a mandate that 15% of all housing units developed in any building must be set aside into a controlled rent, uh, controlled cost program. Um, as Nancy Florian said, our uh, set aside program has generated more guaranteed affordable units than every other jurisdiction in America's programs combined. Um, you also have to look at producing, when you don't produce enough new housing, people who would otherwise use that housing squat in your more affordable housing. So it's, it's an interesting dynamic where if you're not creating new housing, then you're exacerbating the affordability crisis for everybody. So creating new housing is part of the solution of addressing affordability across every level of the income spectrum. Uh, in places like Long Branch, we've taken the approach of not upzoning the housing. You know, we, we considered the Long Branch community. In places like Silver Spring, we take the approach of lending money into uh, projects like the Octave, a brand new micro unit building, or the senior affordable buildings that has gone up right next to the uh, library. Um, there's others in downtown Silver Spring right next to United Therapeutics. We own a whole building there. So we use every tool at our disposal, but I really want to emphasize for everyone here today, if your housing market isn't producing enough housing, then that makes affordability worse for everybody. There's not enough housing to go around. The prices go up for everybody. So you gotta balance your solutions, including the production of new housing. And that is what's the hardest thing for local governments to do. Okay, we have a young group here. Um, my name is Gabrielle and I'm 11. I live two blocks, I think, from here. And I was wondering, you guys can help us from our school, we have a field that's all dirt, and every time when we play soccer, sometimes we get hit by rocks because when we slip down and get hit. So we're wondering, you guys can help us. What school do you go to? We go to Rolling Terrace Elementary School. And I see something here. The Board of Education has requested. Tell us about that. Um, we're. The ed education are requesting 755, 55, um, $50,000. Um, so if you guys can help us. Thank you so much for your question. <laughs> I'm going to turn to the chair of the education committee, our wonderful Craig Rice. Well, thank you very much for your question, young man. And let me just say that uh, we know that MCPS is doing great things because you did a great job in representing not only your school, but your community and advocating for yourself. That's something that is very important and a great lesson to teach. Let me just uh, double down on this very quickly. We have a commitment to make sure that we're providing equitable playing fields for all children throughout Montgomery County. We understand that there are some areas in the county that can afford to buy uh, very uh, extravagant fields, uh, but it doesn't mean that that absolves us of our responsibility as government to make sure that in areas where folks don't have the means to pay for those kind of exorbitant fields that you don't still deserve to have a great field to play on. And so yes, we will be fighting to make sure that equity is there and that you get your quality fields as well as throughout Montgomery County and a lot of other places that are having the same challenges as well. So thank you very much for your advocacy and we will certainly take that back as a recommendation for the Education Committee. And I just want to say you're the best lobbyist we've heard in a long time. <laughs> Yes, my name is Jeffrey Kidd. I'm uh, from Germantown, Maryland, and very concerned about climate change. 
I know that there is a bill, Bill 4416, before the uh, county council being considered now. And uh, I know that uh, many of you do not support that bill, and that bill is, uh, is, uh, requires the county pension system to divest of fossil fuel companies, which I think is extremely important. Um, to those of you... Thank you. To, to those of you not supporting the bill, can you please, uh, you obviously believe that it's okay to profit from the destruction of the climate. Can you please tell me how you would explain to a 10-year-old child your logic, and to these kids right here, I want to hear the exact language that you would use to explain this point of view to a child that it's okay to profit from the destruction of the climate. Thank you. So I'm going to take the first crack, even though I am the lead sponsor for the legislation, all right? And then I will turn to one of my colleagues. Um, it has been my privilege to be the lead sponsor, in part because our county is totally committed to this issue, okay? We are a carbon neutral county, ladies and gentlemen. There are very few counties in the United States of America that can lay claim to that. We buy 100% of our power as renewable power. We were the first county in the United States of America to pass a green bank, the first county in the United States of America to pass what's called a benchmarking law. We are at the forefront of sustainability, which is why I introduced this legislation, particularly with the Trump administration now. It's like, oh my goodness, we have to do everything we can at the local level. And we are constrained by law as to how much we can do because the fiduciary duty of the pension plan trumps everything else, if you'll pardon the, 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 the pun. And so it has made it difficult. But we are continuing to work very hard on this issue, and I've been having lots of conversations with Councilmember Hucker and others with respect to this. We are developing a path forward to address this issue. We are not giving up on this issue. I can promise you that. Let me turn to Mr. Hucker. Um, the, um, I mean, the climate crisis we're facing is an absolute existential emergency. There's no question about that. Um, and it would be great, and I'm, I'm glad to see so much applause, and I'm glad to see so much concern all over the county, and that doesn't surprise me one bit. Um, when I represented this district in the General Assembly, I was the lead sponsor, uh, lead co-sponsor of the bill to create the Renewable Portfolio Standard, another bill to pass the Clean Cars Bill, and I was the lead sponsor for four years of the biggest renewable energy project Maryland's ever planned, the Offshore Wind Project, which was a really historic bill, and hopefully we're going to get wind turbines spinning off, off Ocean City soon. Um, the, um, I, two things uh, to say. One is, as Roger said, we're limited in our, in our, in our uh, authority under federal law. So we can't pass a bill that allows us to do something we're not allowed to do under federal law, right? What we can do is use the bully pulpit and all the persuasive powers that come with the county and these nice TV cameras we own and things like that to pressure the Board of Investment Trustees to divest. That's the goal. You're absolutely right. They shouldn't be profiteering off fossil fuels. So we're going to pass some kind of statement, and I'll leave it to the sponsor to decide what it looks like. Um, and I'm sure we're going to be united in passing it. And then I don't think it's going to stop there, because like I said, we can't make them do it, and I don't think they want to do it. I think we're going to have to call in all the managers, call in the Board of Investment Trustees before the council, talk to them about our priorities, ask, and make them walk through their portfolio. Ask them why they still hold Peabody Coal. Ask them why they have stocks that are fossil stocks that are underperforming. They're breaking their fiduciary responsibility, as far as I'm concerned, by not selling those. All we can do, and I'm committed to do it, is pull them in here and embarrass them and send a very strong signal from everybody up here, I believe, will we'll get, um, that they need to sell those stocks. That's, that's a top priority for us, but it shouldn't take our eye off the ball. The real ball, as far as what we can do, is reducing carbon. Right? We can pass that bill or a resolution or a statement or a letter or anything else, and it doesn't reduce carbon at all. We have ambitious carbon reduction goals for the county and for the state. The state just raised theirs, and they overrode Governor Hogan's veto. We're not on track to meet our carbon reduction goals in Montgomery County. I've called hearings, special hearings, to call the county and the school board and other folks in front of us to find out why they don't have more solar panels on all the schools, for example, why we're not doing everything we can to reduce our energy costs and to increase our renewable energy. Those are all the things we need to do as a county united, including pressuring the Board of Investment Trustees to sell their stocks. 
we're going to pass a united statement, I believe, but that's not going to be the end of it. We actually have to get the stock sold as well. Great. I'm Chris Holbein. I'm a uh, proud resident of Gaithersburg. I'm, uh, thank you all so much for coming here to answer our, our questions. Um, dozens of cities and counties across the nation have passed regulations to crack down on the horrific abuse of wild animals in traveling circuses. Um, Montgomery County has been uh, a leader on many important animal protection issues, and I'm wondering if this is one where we can take strong action. Thank you. I will allow the chairman of HHS, George Leventhal, to take first crack at this. I Chris, thanks for the question. Um, I've been in contact very recently with the Humane Society, and um, I understand that many jurisdictions have passed a, a range of restrictions on uh, abuse of animals in, you know, spectacle. And so I'm working very closely with Craig Rice. We're, uh, we've, we've gotten the proposal from the Humane Society, uh, and I'm, we're just, I just got it a couple of days ago. So I'm, I'm very interested in continuing the progress that we made when we banned the, sell, the sale of pets from puppy mills. Um, that passed unanimously, and I think that the county will continue to make strides in the area of animal welfare, and I think we will introduce something that restricts um, animal acts, uh, cruelty to animals, the use of exotic animals, and we're just working on it. We just got it in the last few days. But uh, Craig and I just agreed we're going to work very closely together, and I'll turn it over to Craig. Well, yeah, no, I, look, it's, 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 it's no question that uh, the days of using animals in circus acts is antiquated. Uh, and really doesn't do anything to uh, really benefit our communities. And so from that perspective, it's one in which we've got uh, to say who we are as a community. And so I think that uh, us passing legislation that reflects who we are and our values in terms of saying that that's not who we are and we don't think that you know, highlighting and showcasing animals that aren't meant to be jumping from platform to platform on two legs uh, is not what we deem as entertainment here in Montgomery County. And so uh, we hope to be very supportive. Okay, my name is Sofia Marianovich. I, am, I, work, I live in uh, Rockville. And so I, am, I have two things. First of all, I'm a survivor of domestic violence. And part of the problem in being a survivor of domestic violence is I've had to encounter police misconduct. And so I was actually part of the coalition in 2016 to actually get the law changed in Maryland for HB 1016 so that we have more police accountability here in Maryland. Now I'm asking, what are you going to do to support us in ensuring that we have civilian review boards for police accountability in, in Maryland? In particular, we're asking for um, two voting civilian members and no more than four police trial board members on, on a civilian review board. Additionally, as a survivor of domestic violence, I have not seen my son in over a year because I, I, even though I have a PhD in immunology and microbiology and I'm a robotics engineering instructor, the, what I've been dealing with in court, um, the, the way abusers operate is they stress you out and keep you in court for as long as, as they can so that I've actually lost total custody of my son. I haven't seen my son in over a year and I am asking for Montgomery County to support the um, domestic violence exchange centers mm -hmm. so that domestic violence survivors can exchange our children um, with people that we trust. We need trauma-informed people because that's the problem I found in court is our judges aren't trauma-informed, our police officers aren't trauma-informed, and, and that's why I've been dealing with police misconduct. And so I'm asking you to support, uh, when uh, we were talking to you, I think on uh, April 23rd about this issue, but I'm asking you to support trauma-informed police and domestic violence exchange centers. Thank you. Thank you. So sorry for 
the issues you're dealing with. I'm going to turn it to the chair of our Public Safety Committee, Mark Elrich. So, so I can answer the second question better than I can answer the first, and I'll tell you why. Uh, we talked about the domestic violence exchange centers just today, and we are absolutely committed, A, to supporting what the executive has in his budget. Most of us don't think there's enough in the budget in terms of just the hours for the one center they're talking about opening, so we're supportive of increasing the hours for that. And I think all of us feel we need more than one exchange center in Rockville. We need something in the down county on the east side, and we need something farther north than Rockville. Craig happily pointed out that uh, uh, Rockville is considered by some of the up county to be the down county. Uh, so we're looking at multiple exchange centers, and we're looking at funding them properly so that the judges will actually use them. Because if we don't provide enough hours for reasonable exchanges, then we will not get the use that, that we anticipate. So we are all very supportive of this. On the civilian review issue, I have, or people have tried to schedule meetings and unfortunately missed the last two meetings, not me. Um, and so we are waiting for a meeting. We're going to be talking about um, the civilian review boards. I haven't seen until I saw um, the proposal today what exactly people are asking for, but I th at least my, me personally believes there's a role for civilian review boards. I think there are too many unanswered, unresolved questions. Um, I think that they will be a service to everybody. I think in, in conjunction with the cameras that we're using now, this is making everybody in the, com in the community better off because now we have a record of every interaction that people have with the police. And so I think that's really important. But I think there's a ro role for civilian review boards and we're gonna talk about it and hopefully we'll get legislation out of it. I've been told the executive is supportive, but I actually haven't heard from the executive himself. Um, but I think we can move something forward. So let me also have Council Member Sidney Katz, who's a member of the Public Safety Committee, weigh in as well. Thank you very much, and I'm sorry for all, all that you've gone through. Um, you know, and, and Mark certainly said it all today. We did have this uh, meeting today. But I did want to mention that in Montgomery County, we have the, we have the Family uh, Justice Center. And it's located in Rockville, and it literally is a one-stop shop for people who have gone through the, the horrible situation that you've gone through. And it's a place where the, everybody is there. The, the uh, sheriff is there. There's police there. There's people in, in, in the various uh, nonprofit communities that will sit down and work with each individual person. Many times their families are there. We just had a, an organization donate cl close to 300 stuffed animals so that they when a child comes to that place and it's certainly never a, a good time in their life but at least they have something that they can continue to to hold on to and to and to make a, a better moment for them so we are trying our very best and candidly the family justice center in montgomery county uh, is is probably one of the best in America. That's not to say that we couldn't do it better, and that's not to say that we don't always strive. But I have to tell you, we are very proud of what the uh, sheriff and the and the state's attorney have done for that for that facility. Thanks. Uh, it's great to be able to talk to you here in our community in Long Branch. I'm Seth Grimes, resident of Tacoma Park. I have two very quick remarks that don't call for response, and then I have a question. Uh, Council uh, President Berliner, I'm very glad that you have committed to bringing the $15 minimum wage that Councilmember Elridge proposed back this year before the County Council. Uh, Councilmember Hucker, thank you for introducing uh, bringing a paramedic to the Tacoma Park Fire Station. That is something we lack, that we really need with the relocation of Washington Adventist Hospital. And I recognize that Council Member Katz and Council Member Elrich have voted for that in committee. And I ask the rest of you to support putting a paramedic, which the county executive committed to two years ago throughout the county, uh, in Tacoma Park. Now, here's my real concern. It is that the county executive has proposed cutting the budget for Health and Human Services, most of the contractors by 1%, cut by 1% to our social safety net, things that are really of essential importance to the poor people, uh, uh, people who are most needy in our county. That doesn't even account for the, raise, the rise in costs just due to inflation. I ask you all to 
eliminate the county executive's proposed cut, to restore it, to even consider adding money to account for inflation, to take other steps to increase the strength of our county's social service contractors, for instance, moving contracts that have been out for uh, a long time, for five years, into the baseline budget. We need to strengthen our partnerships with county nonprofits, including, uh, for instance, Shepherd's Table, where I serve as board vice chair. Uh, all of them, however, throughout the county. Thank you. I'll just briefly respond, and then I'll turn to the chair of the HHS committee, who I know is deeply committed to this issue as well. I am confident that we will put on our, quote, reconciliation list, restoring that cut, as well as giving one, two, three percent increments on our, quote, reconciliation list. And we will work very hard, because you are absolutely right. Our nonprofit partners are so terribly important to the work we must do, and their workload, unfortunately, is getting bigger, not smaller. So I promise you that this council as a whole is going to do everything it can to find the dollars to actually put us on a positive path. But I know the chairman of the HHS committee is equally committed to that result. Indeed, and I thank the council president for his expression of support, and thank you, Seth, for the excellent question. It was a very strange and arbitrary cut. Uh, other departments didn't get cuts. The overall, this is a pretty healthy budget. Um, I don't understand why HHS was targeted I really don't understand it. I don't think it speaks well uh, to the priorities in this budget. This is um, a cut that would affect service providers for the most vulnerable, the people who need the most help from government, and we should be on the side of the sick and the poor and the elderly and the homeless and uh, drug abusers and uh, children. And um, I, I simply can't fathom the logic behind this random and arbitrary cut, and I do hope uh, that you and other community leaders will continue to voice your concern about it. It's not the kind of thing that is consistent with our values as a county and as a progressive government. So thank you very much for asking the question. I'm gonna break with precedent because Ms. Navarro hasn't had an opportunity to really give voice to these issues. Well, as chair of the Government Operations Committee, we already started having a conversation about the issue of putting certain uh, grants into the base budget. I think that you know the grant program is one that I feel has had a lot of different iterations, but there is no doubt that we have so many organizations providing essential services for quite a while, and they should not have to come every year uh, to, to respond. So we're looking at either multi-year awards as well as really analyzing what can go into the base. In addition, we've also heard from nonprofits about the issue of procurement, uh, and we're trying to work to make sure that that's easier and that organizations can get the money uh, sooner than later, et cetera. So this is really an attempt, a more holistic attempt that is not just an HHS committee, but also in government operations, so that we can ensure that our nonprofit sector has the kind of support that they deserve, because what they're doing uh, day in and day out does not get any easier. We know that poverty is rising. We know that we have a lot of needs, uh, and we really count on them uh, to help us provide those services. So again, thank you for your advocacy on that. My name is Sabine Doan. I live in Potomac, Maryland. Um, I want to come back to the issue that was raised earlier, the Bill 4416 about the um, pension funds in Montgomery County. I just, uh, to the best of my knowledge, there is a mandate within their fiduciary responsibility to um, take into consideration social justice and um, climate change issues. And uh, I think that has not been happening. And I want to know if you will be uh, willing to hold their feet to the fire in this uh, regard or just let it pass like an afterthought. Thank you. So let me say quite clearly that we are not gonna let this slide, okay? It isn't a law that they must do it. They are allowed to consider it and take it into account. I personally don't know how they are even considering it and taking it into account if they have people like Peabody Cole in their portfolio, okay? It makes no sense to me. And we've pushed real hard and they've pushed back real hard. We're gonna keep pushing, okay? We are not gonna let this rest. Thank you for your question. <clears throat> I really concur with the comments from my colleagues, uh, Roger Berliner and Tom Hucker. This is going to have to be a multi-year effort. And for those of you who have taken the time to get involved in this issue, uh, you have moved the ball forward significantly. And um, Council Member Berliner has moved the ball forward significantly. Uh, 
if we proceed, as I believe we also should, with a very clear, very forceful resolution, uh, it can't end there. And we're going to have to engage with the Board of Trustees consistently over a period of years to see their commitment and their follow through to the goals that we outline. We, we have to work with them. That's the challenge. We can't force them. We have to work with them. And they have powers that we cannot take away. So we have to figure out how to get it done in a way that is consistent with federal law. And that's going to require ongoing engagement and accountability in a respectful, collaborative way. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks. Uh, hi, my name is Susan Alexander, and I've lived in Tacoma Park for uh, about 24 years. Um, so this is, uh, this is kind of for the Education Committee, but hopefully will be interest, of interest to everyone. Uh, I was very glad to hear people say earlier that you wish to be advocates for communities facing development. Um, and I know that can be very hard, especially when two apparent goods are colliding. Uh, right now we're in a situation where Montgomery College wishes to modernize its science and math facilities, which is a very good thing. Um, but we also have a neighborhood that wants to see its residential and historic character preserved, which is also a very good thing. And so uh, we seek a win-win for the situation, and we think there is one. And, and that is that the college owns some property on Burlington Avenue, and uh, they could build there, and they could do it really quickly. And we heard people from the college, students and faculty, pleading to have something done quickly. They say they don't have microscopes, they don't have modern facilities, their facilities are worse than, than Montgomery County high schools. I mean, that is not a good situation. So uh, this would be a really excellent solution that would have the development happen on the part of the campus that can best accommodate it. It would be quick, and it might very well be cheaper. So as you take up this part of the budget, which I know you'll be doing very soon, um, I hope that you will give us some consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you for raising the question. I know Mr. Elrich and Mr. Hucker have been involved in this conversation. Mark, why don't you start? So I've been working very hard and just had another conversation today with the college to try to reach an accommodation. I mean, it is, it is without a doubt that everybody in the community, including that part of Tacoma Park, supports the need for a math science building. And frankly, people would rather see it built faster and sooner than later. So there's no interest in either to delay it or to prevent the construction of the space. But the space is absolutely critically needed, and we have to provide this resource to the students there. Um, but it didn't, the equipment didn't get old and dilapidated because the renovations were put off a year. That equipment should have been replaced, and some of these issues should have been dealt with a long time ago, and that has more to do with their budgeting priorities than the council because this council never turned down efforts to modernize equipment and stuff there. So I think we can get to a solution. The community has always gotten to solutions before. Everybody understands that this is about being neighborly, and I absolutely believe that you can build everything they need on that campus, and we can do it in a timely manner, and we can do it in a way that respects the fact this is one of the very few colleges that actually sits in a residential neighborhood, which makes it positioning unique, but I think we're going to get to a yes and a win for everybody. Let me turn it to the, your district council member, Tom Hucker. Uh, I mean, Mark explained this very well, but yeah, I mean, you, you know the issue and the, and the trade-offs very well, and this isn't unique. Um, it is unusual to have a college campus in the middle of a residential area, but it's, it's not unique, and we have these sort of um, neighboring development pressures, you know, all over the county. Um, this council has been very supportive of getting the math and science building renovated. Absolutely. I would just so for the folks that um, are wondering about that question, last year uh, the county exec had taken that out of the, the capital improvement plan. We put it back in, and that's on track. Uh, to get funded because those we need to be training the next generation of engineers and lawyer and doctors and nurses we have a great shortage in all these areas and we need to make sure that they have state-of-the-art facilities right here in Montgomery County and don't have to leave our county um, we're you know we Mark and I and probably others have been in multiple meetings with the neighbors to make sure not just that that building um, 
is made in a way that's as compatible as possible with the neighborhood. They, we've brought in arbitrators, we've brought in, they, I, I think are bringing a new architect um, who has some creative ideas um, that they think are gonna go over better with many of the neighbors. Um, but it's not just about that building, as you know, it's about the overall expansion capacity of the college in the future. We're gonna just have to keep, stay engaged, keep our eye on the ball, and keep both sides talking to each other. In previous years, they weren't really doing that very well we've been really pushing them to the table to talk to each other and, and work out the problems. I, I just want to point out that um, the money that you appropriated the last time was for a different location of the building. Uh, so the location of the building has changed, just so you're aware. Same project, yeah. uh, you're same project right. different location. Not good location. Okay. Good evening, Ian James Barclay. I've been in the city of Tacoma Park off and on for 63 plus years. Uh, otherwise known as the People's Republic. And my question is about sustainability. As somebody who regularly, multiple times a day, rides public transport, ground transportation, I see it happen all the time. I, many years ago, became aware of what was called then IVHS, Intelligent Vehicle Highway System. Well, that was a mouthful, and so they changed it to Trans, uh, Intelligent Transport America, I believe, is the current moniker. And what we need in this age of microcircuitry and networking is we need traffic lights to be aware that a bus with 40 passengers is just about to make that green light, and that light shifts to yellow, the bus has to stop, and then one car with one individual in it comes across the intersection and it's high time that the council and the county at large gets committed to at least some uh, projects that are uh, show projects where we can see that the amount of energy, when you talk about a large bus getting started up, I shudder to think of how much diesel is consumed. And as somebody who's a long suffering lung patient, 100% disabled because of my lungs, and having breathed the foul air in the summertime over these last several years, which is often borderline red, it's in the high orange, I please beseech you to spend a few shekels and set up a, a project to at least demonstrate the kind of availability that this has. And our fire stations have a little button they can push like in Tacoma Park, and I again want to applaud Seth for what he said about an EMS located in Tacoma Park, and I highly uh, expect that to happen because we are losing our hospital, and it's down the road, but it's coming. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for your question, and rest assured we are spending the shekels to make that happen. Okay, the technology exists, as you say. There's no excuse for it. We are making that happen. I actually have, have advanced that for advanced signalization of our, our traffic lights for cars, too. I mean, we have these queues that line up because the traffic lights don't know there's a queue. Well, actually, we have the technology today where the traffic light could change if, in fact, they knew how many people were queued up. That technology exists. It's in other communities, and it reduces travel times in some communities by 10 to 15%. If we can reduce travel times by 10 to 15 percent in this community, hallelujah. So I promise you, we are on this for our buses. We are trying to make this happen with bus rapid transit. We are trying to do everything we can to get people out of their cars into efficient mass transit program. The Purple Line, get our metro fixed, get our buses running, and get state-of-the-art bus rapid transit with these kinds of technologies. We are on it, sir. Ms. Florine. Hi. Uh, and one thing that people don't know is that we, the county does have a system, and it's more rudimentary than what you described, uh, but we do have a system for uh, managing the traffic lights. Uh, there's a really cool place that's worth a visit up in uh, Gaithersburg, uh, Command Central, I forget the name of it, where uh, we do have cameras at many of our major intersections, and they do adjust the light timing uh, on a, on a, on a at-the-moment uh, basis uh, to respond to community incidents and the like. 
And it, it's a, a more sophisticated uh, situation than the fire stations have indeed, but uh, in a central location. So just so you know, we've been looking at this issue for a long, long time, and certainly the priority of buses is a huge issue uh, that requires a somewhat more sophisticated approach than we currently have in place. But we've been pushing for this for years, and uh, we may get a bit closer to it now. Well, we just need to make it happen because, yeah, yeah, again, right. with the interactivity, see, that's the problem with someone watching a camera. Yeah. If they go for a rest break or whatever, they, that's requiring a lot of extra work. All it takes is the transponder for the GPS on the bus to say to the light, I'm almost through the light. Please hold the light for a few seconds instead of changing and thereby Stopping We're that all bus. I'm trying to get a word in here because there is actually, I wish, I wish we could pay for our wish shackles, that'd be awesome. But there is actually a capital budget item in the budget this year, it's about 12, maybe 13 million dollars, that puts a new communication system onto buses so that they can interact with lights as well as provide uh, Wi Fi. Um, so we're doing a lot to invest in our bus. Starbucks, fleet. it's coming next. <laughs> yes. Hi, good evening, council members, council president. Thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, speak before you. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking you for uh, passing the rent, the landlord-tenant relations bill, uh, 1915 last year. Uh, it, it, the bill is a great step to building trust between uh, residents, especially here in Long Branch, and uh, county agents and agents for landlords. Uh, but when it comes to trust, I would urge the council to start thinking about taking up sanctuary policies for the whole county as a whole. Um, you know, with thank you. With, with this current climate, we are seeing that folks, you know, recently there was a DACA student who was deported uh, uh, for very unquestioned, for very vague reasons. And at the, at the most recent legislat uh, legislative session, all of the majority of the Montgomery County delegation supported the Trust Act. And the Trust Act had uh, tremendous support in the House but it failed to make it out of the Senate. So we're asking the council, as uh, my name is Renato Mendoza, I'm an advocacy specialist with CASA, um, to, to take up sanctuary policy legislation at the county level uh, and really stand with our uh, county immigrants. Uh, we know that Baltimore County recently uh, issued an executive order to limit the amount of uh, enforcement that police have in terms of immigration. The city of Hyattsville also recently did it. I think that Montgomery County can also take bold steps uh, to continue making this a great place for everybody to live in. Um, and as CASA and other advocates, we're gonna be formally engaging with you all at the council level um, to, on this issue and uh, housing policy as well. Thank you very much. So I will offer just a few observations and then turn to Ms. Navarro, who I've worked with very closely on this. As council president, I went to Annapolis to testify uh, with respect to this legislation. And let me just share this observation with you. One, Montgomery County prides itself on being a welcoming community. We have 170 different cultures in Montgomery County. We have over 140 different languages spoken in Montgomery County. It is extraordinary how diverse our community is, and it is one of the great assets of our county. Everyone in our county must feel respected and safe in our county. And I want you to know that we take some pride in how we go about our business when it relates to immigration. Our police are not immigration enforcement agents, and they never will be, okay? So we shared with Annapolis how we do our work because we do feel it works in Montgomery County and we are proud of it. And so I would say to you, we are very comfortable with how we do this work and we think it's work that holds our community together. Ms. Navarro? 
Yeah, I think that um, what Council President has said is very important. You know, there seem to be some myths out there, and one of the myths is that somehow Montgomery County is not paying attention to public safety. It's been very clear, and we have been on record, that um, when it comes to public safety, that is number one. But it's also clear that public safety, it's all about ensuring trust in the community. So if you've got a situation where your police department is deputized uh, to conduct uh, just you know random ad hoc deportation rates, then of course you're not gonna get the collaboration that you need from your community. And for Montgomery County with such a large immigrant population, we need that very, very much. And so there is that real uh, interaction right there that is really important. So that's number one. And so, you know, I've heard a lot from people who oppose this that think that somehow Montgomery County is just carte blanche allowing anybody to do whatever. And that is just not true. At the same time, we also have to be mindful of our resources. And so for us to have to deputize our police officers and use our resources because Congress has just failed to do its job to pass comprehensive immigration reform, it's wrong. It's just absolutely wrong. And so it is going to be very important, I think, for Montgomery County residents to stand up and understand that we do have many families in this county who have been here for over 30 plus years when it comes to an influx of immigrants. Maybe some of them are with mixed uh, document status because they're trying to become residents. You know, and sometimes people think that folks just don't want to do it. Well, it's because there isn't a broken immigration system. Uh, but there are many who, have, who are residents who are working very hard. You know, we do know that our children uh, are out there and they're hearing this and there's a lot of tension and a lot of fear mongering happening. So we're gonna do whatever we can to support all of our residents and we're gonna do everything possible. We're gonna do everything possible to protect our way of life here in Montgomery County, but most of all, protect our public safety. So yes, we will engage in a conversation about what is the next step, but I do really, truly um, want to thank uh, the residents of this county for what they do every day to stand up to bigotry and to stand up and defend our way of life in this county. We have to be vigilant and we have to defend it. Yeah, thank, thank you very much for, uh, for your comments. I think they're, they're very important. Uh, we're just asking that those, those be codified and made into legislation that can, that can really offer those protections. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Cindy Dibella from Tacoma Park. And the first thing I'd like to um, endorse the comments of the young gentleman who just spoke. But I wanted to address, um, and come back to the question of energy, energy use in the county. And I completely support what you said, that we, the divestment issue is just the tip of the iceberg. So what I would like to know is what three things in this, com in this coming budget do you have that focus on reducing further energy use in the county and pushing Montgomery County into the leadership on climate change and greenhouse emissions? Um, I'm going to offer some things. I don't know if I'll get the definitive three, uh, but one of the largest, no, the largest contributing sector to uh, greenhouse, you know, to carbon emissions is transportation. As a result of the changes in power plant emissions, uh, that sector has now dropped in its contribution to the overall problem, and transportation is now the single largest sector. So our ability to reduce driving is a major contributing factor. It's something we really can have an influence over. So we're working very hard in this current budget. You have a proposal for bus transit on Route 29. I can tell you, friends, we had a very contentious public hearing last night. Very contentious public hearing last night for a simple proposal to expand the quality of bus service and bring a very basic level of BRT to Route 29 to tackle the number one contributing problem to climate change in pollution, which is the transportation sector. We have proposals in the budget for other improvements to bus service. We're taking up the Bethesda sector plan right now. It's not a budget proposal, but it is a huge part of transit-oriented development, putting development in downtown Bethesda so it doesn't go farther out and cause more driving. There are many, many ways that we are working incredibly hard at the local level here. Ms. Florian wanted to speak. Well, yeah. Um, one of the reasons we're a little quiet on this is because we, in many ways, we push the limit uh, in the budget on where we're, where we're going on green cars, 
uh, you've heard about the solar, pa our commitment to solar, solar, and Roger went through the laundry list of things that we've been doing. But one of the other things that we're doing in the Bethesda master plan is we're creating a high efficiency area. And all the new development that's going to occur in Bethesda is going to have to meet building standards that have never been, been required before in Montgomery County. And they're going to have to exceed uh, the new green buildings l r rules. Uh, and I think ultimately that will become the standard for uh, countywide thinking about how buildings are created because they are also very bad generators of carbon and the like. So you should know that um, we are looking at this sort of thing on all levels. And Mr. Leventhal oh, has a bill on community solar. Mr. Leventhal? Well, just very briefly, there's a new industry for those who, for whatever reason, are not able to install solar panels on their own roof, whether it's a shaded area or they may live in an apartment building where they have to pay for their own metering. And so I have a bill, which I think is every one of my co-sponsor, every one of my colleagues is co-sponsored, to exempt that form of solar energy from the county's energy tax. And since we have a majority of the council have put their names on the bill, I'm optimistic it'll become law. So I just want to say one more thing. And that is, on Earth Day, for a number of years, I've introduced a package of legislation. My well is running dry. <laughs> for any of you that have ideas as to what more we can be doing, I'm looking at net zero energy buildings and things of that nature, but I am open to hearing from this incredible community, and that's one of the privileges of being in Montgomery County, that we have so many smart people at the cutting edge of so many issues. If there are more things that other communities are doing that we have not done, please, Bring them to our attention. Susan, back to you. One quick question and one quick answer. Ah. Hi, m my name is Thomas Nephew. I'm with Montgomery County Civil Rights Coalition. And in addition to caring about the civilian trial board participation issue, we're also very concerned about the uh, countering violent extremism programs that uh, have taken place in Montgomery County called the Montgomery Model, now known as BRAVE, uh, Building Resilience Against Violent Extremism. Uh, we feel these are not good programs. They're essentially Islamophobic because they tend to uh, focus on Muslim communities, and we are concerned that they also don't seem to have very good uh, science behind them and that the, uh, pro the, these programs are not very well uh, substantiated. Could you take a position on this? Could you please take a hard look at these programs? I promise you we will take a hard look at them, Mr. Eldridge. As I understand it, the executive is going to be having a meeting to discuss this, and then we're going to we're going to follow up with that. Uh, Montgomery County is not running the program this year. This program is run by the University of Maryland. Um, there's some element of cooperation. I've heard concerns. I've also heard people, frankly, in the Muslim community who have not raised this at all. So we're trying to figure out what is the actual impact and. Uh, and stay tuned because we will have a we will follow up with the county executive. Okay, that that about wraps up time, folks, for this town meeting. Great engaging questions this evening. I'm going to turn it back over to Council President Roger Berliner and Councilmember Tom Hucker for a couple of quick closing remarks. The quick closing remarks are: Thank you so much. You are incredibly engaged. We do this a lot, and let me tell you, this is one of the feistiest and most <laughs> well attended council hall meetings we have had in all my years. So I thank you for being here with us and know that we are here to be in service to you. Mr. Hucker? Um, I, I couldn't agree more. Welcome to District 5. It's no surprise to me. The level of sophistication and information in this crowd is daunting and very impressive. And I know there's a lot of good things on TV and a lot of fun places you could be tonight. But for you all to come out and have a standing room only audience uh, in front of this body to talk about wonky policy issues is fantastic. And I really thank you for it because I know as long as I've been involved as a public interest advocate or an elected official, I can tell you we get, we create a lot better policy the more feedback we get from the public. So thank you for doing everything you're doing.